Hello, and welcome to the final lecture of semantics. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the notion of semantic equivalence. And so what do we, what do we mean by that? Well, let's, let's start with an example. So at the very top of the slide, I've written two plus two is equivalent with a question mark to four. And now what we're going to ask is like, what do, when we, when you, when you see this, like you think of your, uh, your primary school uh, arithmetic and you think, of course, these are the same, but let's, let's take a step back and think about in what sense are these two expressions the same? Because to a computer, when you parse these two expressions, they're, they're going to give you different syntax trees. And if you read them in, write them in a file, they're going to be different ASCII sequences. And if you evaluate these, uh, their syntax trees, you'll get different reduction sequences. So two plus two is going to take a transition to four and four won't take any transitions at all. And so at the level of you know, sort of compilation, and at the level of machine code, these two programs are different. Even though they're like almost the smallest program you can think of, they're almost they they're they're different. Like different code gets executed at runtime, but we still sort of have the expectation that in any program that we write, we could change one to the other, and the final answer won't change. Like maybe the performance will be a little bit different because you execute one more instruction in uh, one one version or the other, but the answer won't change. So like, you know, if you compute an integral from zero to two plus two, that's exactly the same as computing the integral from zero to four. And that's actually true in mathematics. You're always allowed to uh, replace equals by equals, but when it comes to putting things in a computer, we have to ask, well, what does equal mean anyway? And so the, the reason this is uh, not an entirely trivial problem is that you can, you, you might start with an idea like, well, okay, two programs that compute the same answer are the same, but what about these two programs up here? So if we have a program that sets L to zero and then returns four, and a second program that sets L to one and then re returns three plus the contents of uh, L, well, both of them are going to evaluate to four, but we can't replace one with the other in an arbitrary program context. So for instance, if the program context in question is to, is a, is something that, uh, oops, that takes your, that takes your original program and then adds the contents of L to the result, then when we take this program right here and plug it into this, this uh, context, we're going to get a new program that says set L to zero, return four, and then add the contents of L. And this one right here is going to say set L to one, return three plus the contents of L, and then add the contents of L again. And so the way you should think about this is we've this underscore is a hole and we're plugging in this program right here, right into that hole. Okay, so these two are not going to give the same answer and it's actually worth spending a moment thinking about why they won't give the same answer. And then we'll actually, we'll actually try it. Okay, so we've got our reference L and so what we're going to do is we're going to set L to zero and we're going to return four and then we're going to add the contents of L. And what do we get? We get four. Okay, now let's try the other one. We're going to set L to one. We're going to return uh, three plus the contents of L and then we're going to add that to the contents of L. And uh, Ah, okay, yes. So, <clears throat> ah, yes, so this looks the same. And now what you're going to see here is that the importance of evaluation order. So L3 evaluates expressions from left to right. Uh, and so what it will do is it'll set L to one, give you three plus one, which is four, and then add one, and that'll return five. But OCaml is evaluating things right to left. So it's saying, well, L was already zero. So we're returning zero here. We're going to set it to one and then we're going to return 
uh, 3 plus 1. So the whole thing will return 4. But now, watch if... Let, let me first set L to 0, so that we're going to start off as the same as everyone else. And now, what we'll do is instead of returning... We'll change the we'll change the order we evaluate these things in, and now we get five because we're evaluating the right hand ar argument first. L gets set to one, and so then this dereference of L gives you uh, gives you one, and so the whole expression returns five. And so OCaml gave us a slightly different answer than uh, than L three will because its evaluation order is a little bit different, but the high level point remains the same, which is that these two programs return the same value but do not behave the same sort of in all program contexts and so so we need a finer notion uh, a more refined notion of program equivalence than uh than just saying they return the same value but on the other hand let's consider another pro so you might think okay well you know if you're modifying the store then these then all bets are off but let's look at another program here and so here, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, um, here is a program that sets L to the L plus one, and then we're going to set L to L minus one. And is that equivalent to setting L to itself? And in a sequential programming language, um, as long as you don't worry about overflows, the answer is yes. So for L3, the answer is yes, because whatever L was, call it N, it's going to go to N plus 1, and then we're going to set it to N plus 1 minus 1, which is going to be N. And so it's not going, it's going to uh, return the same value, a unit, and it's going to uh, leave the store in the same shape as when it started. So it's going to do the same thing as this, and this thing is going to do the same thing as skip. Um, there are differences between these programs in a concurrent setting, but in a sequential setting, they're, they're actually all equivalent. And in fact, we expect compilers to uh, do things like notice this sequence and then uh, optimize it away into a, uh, into a no-op in order to yield faster programs. And that's actually one of the one of the reasons we're interested in uh, in semantic equivalence is because we want compilers to change our program from a slower version into a faster one, and we don't want and we want it to uh, be computing the same thing, the optimized program and the unoptimized program to be computing the same thing. Okay. But for a compiler to optimize things, um, what it needs are actually general laws. So we can't hard code into a compiler a whole bunch of special cases and expect to get anything like decent per, uh, performance. What we need are general program equivalences. So for instance, here are a few equivalences so that we might want. So if we have E1 sequenced with E2 sequenced with E3, is that the same as evaluating E1 semicolon E2 first and then evaluating E3? And so you should think about this for a second and decide uh, decide what your what your opinion is. Here's another example. So if we evaluate an if then else expression and then follow it by an expression E, is it safe to push the E into the uh, the branches. So we're going to say, well, if E1, then E2, LC3, followed by E, is it the same as doing the test and then re evaluate running E2 semicolon E3 or otherwise running E3 semicolon E? And is that in turn the same as uh, pushing the uh, pushing the, uh, the sequencing in from the from the uh, uh, from the left. So if we say, okay, well, if E1, then E2, LC3 is preceded by an E, can we move the E into each branch? And if we, or maybe that's wrong, and maybe what we should do is we should say, well, if we evaluate this, and then should we should we push this E into the conditional? So you should think about these for a second. And some of these are valid and some of these are not. And so um, in a physical lecture, I would ask for shows of hands. But what I want you to do now is to pause the video, 
decide what you want, and then we'll go through these and explain them a bit. So the answer is that the first two are valid and the second two are not. Uh, actually, no, the first two are valid. So reordering, reparenthesizing, sequencing, that doesn't change the meaning. In this, in this one, this uh, second one is also is also valid because what will happen when you execute the program is that you'll do the test and then you'll evaluate either E2 or E3 to a unit and then you'll evaluate E. And that's just going to give you sort of a very similar reduction sequence to doing the test and then running either this one or that one. So this one will also be the same, but this one is not. And the reason that the third one is not a valid rewriting is because um, what's going to happen is if you try to perform this uh, this transformation, E in, in the left-hand side, E is evaluated before E1 is. And on the right-hand side, we've reversed the order. E1 is going to be executed before E. And so if either E or E1 have some, effect, uh, have some updates that affect the behavior of the other one, um, then then you'll get different behavior. But on the other hand, this fourth one actually is valid because we're going to evaluate E and then we'll evaluate, and then after evaluating E for its effects, we're going to evaluate E1 for a Boolean that we'll use to decide whether to run E2 or E3. And that's exactly the same thing that's going to happen here. So here, we're going to evaluate E for its effects and then evaluate E1 and then use the value to branch to either E2 or E3. So, so um, at least for sequen uh, sequential programs, all of these are uh, are equivalent. Okay, oh, all all of these are equivalent. Sorry, except for the third one. And so now here's another here's a uh, here's one you um, which was a bit trickier than than the others. The others you could sort of get just by thinking about the semantics of L one, but here's one that's a little bit harder. So. Here, what we're going to do in the first program is we are going to initialize a reference x, and then we're going to return a function which will, uh, every time it's called, will increment x with the value y and then return the contents of this. So it's going to be a counter value that uh, that increments, that returns a function which uh, which which sort of returns the running total of all its calls. Um, that's a little bit abstract, so let's uh, let's actually write it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say let f is going to be equal to let x equal to ref zero. And now we're going to return a function which takes y and it's going to set x to the contents of x plus y and then it's going to return the contents of x. And so now we have our function f. And on the first call, let's say, let's call it with five, it's going to return five. And if we call it with a three, it's going to return eight. And now if we call it with three again, it's going to return 11. And so now what you can see is that what it's doing is it's storing the running total of all of its all of the arguments it's ever got. Uh, been called with and returning that as a value. So it's like sort of a, a counter which always gives you uh, increasing values as long as you give it positive arguments. And the question is, is this counter program equivalent to creating a counter and then what we do is we decrement the counter, so we subtract y from every uh, from x, and then we return negative x. So are these two programs equivalent? And if you look at the store in the program, obviously they're not going to be different because this one here will always have positive numbers in it as long as you give it positive arguments, and this one here will always have negative numbers. But then, if you think about it a bit more, what you'll realize is that this x is actually um, not visible to the rest of the program because this x do is not returned from this whole expression. All we return is a function which 
accesses this uh, this uh, piece of state and doesn't give you any other way to uh, read or write that that particular reference. And as a and because no but no other part of the program except for this function can see that reference, these two programs actually are equivalent. There's there's yet more uh, there's yet more programs like this. So one thing that we can do imagine doing is extending L3 with a pointer quality. So in Java, for example, if you've got two objects, you can compare them for object identity, and the same is true in uh, in OCaml and uh, and standard ML. If you've got two references, you can compare them for their identity. And so what this is going to do is, is the typing is going to say, well, if you give me two references, I can test the references for equality. And the operational semantics for this is, well, two pointers are the same if they're the same pointer. So if L and L prime are physically the same pointer, then we return true and otherwise we return false. Now let's consider an example which is even harder. So we have two functions, f and g. And what both of them do is they first allocate two pointers x and y, each of which is a pointer to an integer. So you can see that both of them allocate a pointer x and y. And what the first one is going to do is it's going to return a function which takes a pointer as an argument, and then it does a pointer comparison. Is my argument equal to x? And if, the, uh, if that test succeeds, then it returns y. Otherwise, it returns x. And so you can see that this program doesn't directly return x and y, but indirectly a client can get access to them. You could create a third pointer and give it to this function in order to get out x, and then you could pass x in to get out y. So eventually the client, the client program, the context, can get access to both of the pointers that we've accessed, that we've uh, created. And that's unlike the previous example. And what g does is something quite similar. Um, what it does is it's created the two pointers as well, and it does the pointer comparison, but this time we compare it to y instead of x. And so we say, well, if it's equal to y, then return y, otherwise return x. And so now the question is, are these two programs equivalent? Um, they certainly look quite similar. We create two pointers, do a test, and then return one or the other based on the test. Um, and you should think about it for a for a moment before you uh, before you uh, before you decide. Um, like this one is admittedly quite tricky. And having thought about it, you will you will be maybe surprised or maybe not. Um, that these two programs are not the same. And so we can create a context t which, which takes a function um, int to int, and then what it does is it tests whether h of h of z is equal to h of z. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new pointer, and then we are going to test whether um, whether the uh, the these two functions give you back the same answer um, if you test whether h of h of z is equal to h of z. So let's create a new, let's think about this, and then we'll run the program. So if we, for the f, what will happen is um, if we create that third pointer, we do the test, and then we fail. So we return x. And then we pass x to this function, and then it'll return y. Okay, and now that means that h of h of z is going to be is not going to be pointer equal to h of z. But now let's look at g. So with g, we we've created z, and we do the test. And when we do the test, we'll fail, and we'll return x. And then when we call call it on itself again, we will compare x to y, and this will be false. And so we'll return uh, uh, we'll return x. Is that right? Yeah. And so so in the, in this way, uh, 
we'll we'll end up with a uh, with a true answer rather than a false answer compared to compared to compared to g. So let's give it a try. So let's uh, let's define our function h. H is going to be something which takes a uh, it takes a uh, a function. Let's call it g. And what it's going to do is it's going to create a new pointer. And it's going to say is g of g of z equal to g of z. And now we're going to let's create our uh, f zero which we will do let x equal ref zero, let y equal ref zero, and now we'll say we're going to return if x, if z is equal to, let's see, x, then y else x, and we'll do let uh, g zero equal and it's going to be just the same as before, except we're comparing it to y. So now let's try h of f0 and let's see what happens. We get false. And if we try h of g0, we get true. And so just as we predicted from thinking about the program, these two, these two programs are distinguishable. But the thing you should think about, you should realize, is that the notion of program equivalence is actually really subtle. And so, um, before we before we head into uh, more technicalities, like it's worth thinking a bit about what a good notion of semantic equivalence might be. And so, if we had such a good notion of equivalence, well, for one thing, we'd know what programs are because we'd know what they mean. We can say one program is equivalent to another one. And if we have that, then what we can do is we're sort of able to justify optimizations. So, if you have a efficient algorithm. Um, and you have another program which is a clear specification, ideally you'd like to be able to argue that the efficient algorithm implements the, the simple specification. And in general, like this will, if you, uh, if we can prove the soundness of these, uh, of these laws for equational reasoning, then we'll be able to uh, argue mathematically that one program will do the same as the other. And this sort of thing is, you know, the bread and butter of compilers. And so as soon as we have this notion of program equivalence, that's, going, that's what we're going to use to justify the program optimizations that we do. And furthermore, um, from a more... Uh, uh, from a more intellectual perspective, there's a lot of different languages. And at any point in the development of a language, you have potentially new features to add. And one important thing is to understand what adding a new feature will do to the rest of the language. And the thing that you don't want is to add a new feature which breaks all the reasoning principles that programmers already had. So if they expected two programs to be equivalent, say so one, one optimization to be valid, and you add a feature which allows distinguishing these two implementations, well, you know, you're now going to have some very unhappy programmers because either the compiler won't do the optimization or, or now your uh, old valid transformations are now buggy. So if you have, if you understand what the notion of equivalence is, you can make sure that any changes to that program equivalence happen in a sort of thoughtful way. So if you add a feature, you know what it's going to do to, to the language and you can like sort of make an informed in engineering judgment whether, whether you want that change to happen or not. And so, you know, what does it mean for program equivalence to be good? And so the you know the simplest criterion is that if program if we get different answers the program our equivalence must not equate them. So when we talk about program equivalence this is a mathematical notion and we get to make it up. And you know one very simple equivalence relation is to equate all programs. But that's a bad equivalence relation on programs because it, it's equating programs that return different values. So if a pro one program returns five and another returns three, then we don't want them to uh, we don't want them to be judged to be the same. Um, Secondly, and you know, uh, uh, similarly, you know, we don't want to relate a program that terminates to one that doesn't, because uh, um, that's going to again give you weird answers. Like you want. 
two programs to be, that are equivalent to either both terminate or both give you an answer. And thirdly, if we're thinking about a program uh, equivalence, well, it should be an equivalence relation. So it should be reflexive. A program should be equal to itself. The equivalence relation should be symmetric. You know, if E is equivalent to E1, E1 is equal to E2, then E2 should be equal to E1. And it should also be transitive. And so this, this means that like your natural expectations about equality need to be preserved. And finally, um, this notion of we want our notion of equivalence to behave like equality, what we want is we want it to be a congruence. So we saw up here that we judged 2 plus 2 to be equal to 4, and then we expected to be able to replace it in some much larger expression. And so that's what the property of being a congruence gives us. So it says if we know that two things are equivalent, then in any larger program, we can find a E1 as a subterm and change it into an E2, and that's fine. And so subject to these constraints, we want our equivalence to relate as many problem programs as we can, because we want to have as much freedom as possible in order to rewrite one program into another. Okay, so you know that's that's sort of like our heuristic notion of what 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 good equivalences are, and so there's a lot of different ways of doing this, and so let's start with our simple language L typed L1, and so we can say that E1 is equivalent to E2 at a particular type in a particular store typing, such that you know for all stores that are at least as big as the store typing. We, uh, we want either both of the programs to go into an infinite loop, so that is enforcing condition two, and we want them both to evaluate to the same value. So we're saying two programs are the same if given a good enough heap, one that contains all the values that they, uh, that they expect, both of these programs evaluate to the same final configuration. So we get the same value in the same store. And so this is a perfectly good notion of, uh, of equivalence. So it will respect all of our conditions. And then what we can do is we can look at, uh, you know, various contexts and see what happens, see, see what the distinguishing contexts are. And the fact that the language is typed actually helps us. So, you know, if a program has, uh, has the type unit, then the only context it can appear in is, you know, something followed by a dereference or, you know, I guess a way to think about this, it's not the only thing that can follow it, but something that can, that can, de that can distinguish, uh, distinguish results is, you know, we can, we can say, well, if the store is different, then we can, we can, uh, we can plug in something of Boolean into a, uh, into a, uh, into a conditional test. Um, and likewise, you know, if, if we have an integer, we can sort of detect when it's different by um, storing the results of that computation into some location. And so what's going on here is we're, we're trying to ensure that we get different answers for different results. Um, and you know the general the general notion once it, once you check it in these cases you can try to look at it for the set of all contexts and so contexts are basically programs with holes in them and so we can create hole, uh, holes for uh, for l1 uh, programs by looking at the l1 grammar and so we'll say okay we're going to say that uh, um if you have an operand, you can either make a hole on the left or the right. If you have a conditional, you know, we can add a hole either in the uh, uh, test, the then branch or the else branch. If we're doing a store, well, the expression that's being stored into is a hole. And if we're sequencing, we can have a hole either on the left or the right. And similarly for while loops, either a hole can be either the uh, the thing being uh, the loop condition or the loop body. And so now what we can do is we can say, well, okay, we've, we've written down a grammar for terms with holes in them so that we can plug programs into these, uh, into these context, contexts. And we can say that our equivalence relation has the congruence property if 
whenever we judge E1 to be equivalent to E2, we can show that for all contexts and all other types, if plugging th both things in is well typed, then they are then they remain in the in the congruence relation at t prime. And what you can do this is you can prove this by k by case analysis. So the thing is that here we've defined up here what our notion of semantic equivalence, and we've first we've we've built into the definition a notion that. Uh, that they either both loop forever or they both terminate with the same value. And from this, you can prove that it's an equivalence relation pretty easily. You can, you can show that this is reflexive and symmetric and transitive. And now we need to show that it's a congruence. And so we do this by defining what our contexts are and sh establishing the congruence property. So we're going to assume that we have two terms which are related and now we're going to go through these contexts and show that the contextually related things the things the terms in context are also are also uh, are also in the equivalence relation and so you can do this by a case analysis and so what we'll see is that for each c and arbitrary e and s the we'll look at the possible reduction sequences and then for each reduction sequence we'll see what the behavior of e was and we'll use the the equivalence relation for e and d prime to find a similar relation a reduction relation for uh, for c of e prime and so now we can construct these sort of parallel reduction sequences um, so like here's here's an example like let's look at the assignment case so suppose that we're plugging two equivalent expressions into L gets stored in, store the result into L. And so we're going to first assume that E and E prime are equivalent at the type T. And we're going to assume that uh, both L gets set to E and L gets set to E prime are well typed. And so from looking the typing rules, we know that uh, E has to be int and T prime has to be unit. And so now what we want to do is we want to show that L gets set to E and L gets set to E prime are equivalent at type unit. And so what, we're, what we want to show is that first, uh, the assignment is well typed, which is sort of evident, and that the um, assignment for E prime is also well typed, which is again evident. And then we need to show that either both of these terms go for an infinite loop infinitely or they return uh, run to the same to the same store s prime and so the way that we do this is by by exploiting the fact that we know that e is related to e prime and what that means is that uh, either both the e and e prime are going to loop infinitely and so in this case we're going to have some infinite sequence l goes to e goes to E1, goes to E2, goes to... So this is what we're trying to find. L gets set to E, goes to E1, E2, whatever. And so what we can do is we can note that E has an infinite sequence. So if E has an infinite sequence, E, uh, e hat 1, E hat 2, E hat 3, we're able to construct an infinite sequence using the assign to rule. L gets set to E hat 1, L gets set to E hat 2, and so on. And so now... Um, what we're going to what we're going to get is uh, uh, the other possibility is that you know if you try to evaluate L gets set to E we we have a finite execution sequence and because of our typing um, all of these things are going to be uh, assigned to except for the last one and so then what we can do is we can extract out an e hat one and an e hat two and an e hat three, so all the way to the k minus one, and now uh, we have the la the the last state, the the one that we this final state is going to be uh, is going to be skip, and then uh, yeah, sorry, uh, let me back this up. Uh, What's, what's going on is that if the assignment uh, is finite, then every, every step is going to be 
um, this E evaluating. And then the fact that uh, uh, the expression is in uh, the expre the target of the assignment is equivalent to the other target of the assignment is going to let us construct another uh, construct another uh, reduction sequence. So what we're doing is we're going to uh, we're going to say okay well we have an infinite reduction sequence for L gets set to E and so that means we have an infinite reduction sequence for E and then the equivalence tells us we have an infinite reduction se sequence for E prime and then we're going to be able to construct an equivalence infinite reduction sequence for L gets set to E prime. So the, what's going to happen is we're going to say So we know that E is uh, equivalent to E prime at int. And then we have L gets set to E S for some S such that, uh, ah, yeah, we want to show that uh, uh, L, L gets set to E is equivalent to L gets set to E prime at unit. Okay, and so now assume we have some store uh, S such that the domain of uh, gamma is a subset of the domain of S. And now consider the evaluation of L gets set to E and S. And so now the evaluation of this program can either be finite or infinite. And so if it's infinite, so if uh, L gets set to E goes to E1, S1, 2, dot, 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 infinitely. Then by looking at these rule, by these reduction, each of these reductions has to happen by the assign one, uh, by the assign one rule. So, so we're going to have, um, so if you look at any one of these reductions, we're going to see that L gets set to E1, uh, S, uh, let me make it SI, goes to and so if we're uh, if we if we have this then what we're going to the only way we can get this transition is from a transition on e and so therefore from this uh, from this in infinite reduction sequence, we're go uh, so from looking at each of these transitions, we're able to show that we're going to get uh, some some sequence of infinite sequence of transitions for uh, for um, e to e1 to s1 to so on infinitely, and so that means and then since e is equivalent to e prime, we're going to have And so then since we have E is equivalent to E prime, we're also going to have another infinite sequence for, uh, for E prime. And then, you know, for each, of, for each of these transitions, what we can do is we can play the, the, the same game as before, but in reverse. So we can say, well, we know that e prime i goes to e prime of i plus one, and s pro s of i sub one, and so we can we can play the same game as before, and so now we have another infinite sequence, which says that the assignments are uh, are 
are uh, are of e, of L gets set to E prime will will go on infinitely. And so since both of these assignment statements are running infinitely, so therefore um, both uh, both of these both of these two expressions are equivalent. So therefore L gets set to E is going to be equivalent to L gets set to E prime. And so now we have one more case. And so now suppose this case is finite. And so that means that we're going to end at some L get, uh, we're going to end with some value K, K plus one and some S of K plus one. Okay, and so now, and we now from typing, we know that this thing here has to be skip. And so we'll, we can, we can write this down as uh, L gets set to some, uh, let's call it V sub K. And S sub K. Okay, so we have some finite, uh, finite reduction sequence. And now we can do we can look at this finite reduction sequence and say, well, we can consider the sequence that runs. So we have this finite sequence. So what we're able to do is we're able to note that each of these transitions uses the assign rule. And so from uh, from uh, from inversion on each of these transitions, we're able to extract a reduction sequence that looks like this one. And so then what's going to happen is that since E is equivalent to E prime, we know that E prime is going to have its own finite reduction sequence that ends in exactly the same state as before. And so this comes from the definition of, uh, of, uh, of what semantic equivalents for E and E prime are. And so once we have this uh, reduction sequence, you know, sort of step by step, we can apply the, uh, the, we can apply the, uh, the rules and what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to say, okay, well, uh, sort of in lockstep with the previous set of transitions, we'll be able to produce a set of transitions like this. And then if for the final transition, we can apply the assign rule and get skip goes to S of K plus one. And so since this final final state is the same as that one up there, applying the uh, the assign rule will go, will leave us in the final state. And so therefore, E is going to be equivalent. L gets set to E is going to be set to is going to be equivalent to L gets set to E prime. So either way, we're going to end up in the same state. And so therefore, we can judge that the these two the, that the that the uh, that the uh, that the assignment assignment context pres uh, preserves the co uh, congruence property, and we can go through this and do a similar proof for every single one of these contexts, and we'll show that our notion of semantic ex equivalence has the uh, congruence property. And so now, like, well, let's go back and think about our basic examples in a little bit more formal way. And so now you can see that two plus two is equivalent to four for any gamma because they will both reduce to this one will reduce to that one in one step, and then they'll be in the same the same the same heap. Um, and so therefore, we can say that okay, well, these two are not equivalent, um, and we'll be able to show that these two are not equivalent for any gamma because the the stores will end up differently. And we'll be able to show that these two actually are semantic, semantically equivalent. And so that is actually, uh, that's actually uh, quite nice. So as long as the location L is in gamma, these two will be semantically equivalent. And so now we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to look at these general laws and see what happens. So now the uh, the 
the kind of high level high level point here is that a programming language has many notions of equivalence so you know is if we have a typed expression we can think of it as you know the the string a sequence of tokens an abstract syntax tree a function taking a store to this long reduction sequence or an equivalence relation uh the equivalence class of uh terms that are equivalent to this semantically equivalent to this program and so now you know there's a lot of ways you can think about the think about this program and the coarser you make the equality the more work you have to do to establish it but the uh, the more ways that you can use it as well so you sort of get out what you put back in so now one question is suppose we have two expressions e1 is unit and e2 is type a uh, unit is e1 semicolon e2 equivalent to e2 semicolon e1 you should just think about this for a second and see if you can uh, find a counter example to this like the answer is no but you should figure it out and so now if we try to extend this idea to l3 we're going to we're going to run into some problems because uh um we can define a similar notion for l3 where we say okay two programs are contextually equivalent if for every context um that sends uh, sends both programs to type unit either they rub both run infinitely or they uh they both terminate so we're going to say that like there's no context which can uh, which can cause one to go into an infinite loop and one to uh, um, um, one to uh, uh, terminate. So they either both terminate or both loop. And one interesting thing here is that we we're not so picky about saying that the stores have to be this uh, the same in this case because. Um, you know, if we could t exploit this difference, then we could add it to the context C. So um, we're, we're not going to say, as in L1, that these two both had to be the same. We're just going to say, well, um, either they both terminate or they both go into an infinite loop. And so <clears throat> this notion of a contextual equivalence, it turns out to be sort of the right one to use. And um, working with it is... Uh, is actually quite difficult and it's still a research topic um, how to prove contextual equivalence of programs with functions in them and uh, um, even if you say well okay higher order functions are weird and exotic it turns out that if you want to reason about uh, the correctness of separately compiled components uh, say for a C program you still have to think about like this higher order notion of contextual equivalence um, and so it's still an active active area of research Okay, and so now um, I, I could go on about uh, low-level semantics, but I actually want to uh, um, I actually want to sort of wrap things up since I'm sort of hand, uh, heading heading towards the end of my time here. So the point is that you know um, semantics applies not just to high-level languages but also to intermediate languages like the Java bytecode or WebAssembly, and it also applies to assembly languages. Um, so if you're uh, if you're thinking about uh, proving the correctness of a uh, of a program well you if it's really security critical you want to make sure that that correctness proof goes all the way down to the binary that you actually uh, actually uh, actually run um, <clears throat> and so now um, I just want to uh, sort of wrap up um, so one one thing is that there's going to be course feedback. I'm not sure how it's going to run this year because of the, all the changes to online lectures, but do fill in the, the feedback form and tell the department about it because I really do want to know um, how the course could be improved and what could be the same. And also, if you just feel more comfortable sending me an email, please feel free to do that. Um, and so now we've talked a lot about the semantics of languages and so now how can this inform language design and so you know if we want to if what does it mean to have a good language design and the answer you know sort of the things that we need are a precise definition of the language so that the designers can talk to each other and talk to tell users accurate programmers like 
accurately what the language is and isn't supposed to do. Um, you know, once you have your language design, you, there's a variety of uh, of good technical properties that you'd like. Like, you know, is the uh, is the semantics deterministic? Um, is type ch type type checking decidable or not? Like, what's its complexity? Um, like how hard are the algorithms to implement and then once you have the your compiler like how good is the language actually to use does it support uh, uh, does it support um, IDE features like uh, you know IntelliSense does it uh, allow data strong data abstraction so that you can have like strong module boundaries is the program actually any fun to program in um, and so you, we want to support all of these things and um, you know, as the mention of fun indicates, like semantics can't solve all of them, but it can help with many of them. And, you know, even things like fun, like you can check the consistency of your definition using your semantics. And that just reduces the number of, uh, of bad surprises a programmer is going to get. And so, you know, you use semantics to understand languages, you know, what you depend on as a programmer, what you provide as a compiler writer, and we can use it as a tool for language design to make sure that we know what our design choices are and how they interact with one another. And, you know, often you'll, we will discover that there are unwanted interactions and we want the feature to be designed in a different way to ensure that like the features are all orthogonal. And then once we have the semantics, you know, we hope that we can use it to prove properties of specific programs, which are the things that at the end of the day we actually care about. Um, and so now what you're what you've been equipped with are the tools to understand what language designs are and to actually go look at the uh, uh, programming languages literature. So these uh, this notion of inference rules and type safety is like sort of the the foundational background assumptions of virtually all PL literature. And now you'll be able to read it and use it to uh, inform your own designs. So uh, I'll I hope you've had a, a good time in this course, and I hope you design good languages in the future. Thank you very much.